So I, uh, this is a talk, a variant of a of talk I've been giving a few times now about, um, you know, really scholars taking over the big data world. That was the reference to the Northeast Scholar Symposium talk where uh, what we're seeing at TypeSafe is that um, Spark is really driving interest in Scala because it's just, it's like the perfect storm. It, it's the ideal language for uh, getting things done quickly and efficiently. I, I think no, uh, like API or framework better demonstrates the best aspects of Scala than Spark and maybe hides the, you know, the sort of uh, gnarly bits that everyone likes to complain about a little better than other systems. So uh, this is a little bit about what it's like to do data science uh, at large scale with, uh, with Spark. Um, now I put this slide up here not because I want to push my books, but because I, you know, I th this is a developer talk really, and I think that every developer talk has to have some XML. So there you go. Um, so I, uh, before I joined TypeSafe, uh, around 2011, I started doing uh, Hadoop consulting. Uh, I decided I wanted to get into the big data space. Uh, actually, what was attractive t to me about it was, well, it was kind of new and exciting. It, it had you know hard problems, you know, big scale and all that. But also, uh, they were using a lot of the math and machine learning that I had done in physics, and so that was kind of an attraction. And I actually haven't used any of that since I started this, but nevertheless, I started doing uh, Hadoop consulting then, and quickly got really upset at the quality of the tools and the experience. So this was kind of my LinkedIn profile as of like 2012, where I just started uh, trolling the Hadoop community because I thought it sucked. Um, and, <laughs> You know, I thought we could do a lot better. So, in fact, at the Northeast Scholar Symposium, uh, an earlier talk three years ago, I said, you know, big data really needs to be functional. We need to be doing functional programming in this stuff. And so this last uh, year's session was more about we, we actually achieved this. Uh, you know, this is three years ago or so. And, well, so if we're going to do data science at scale, there's no better platform than the JVM. I mean, you can argue about its strengths and weaknesses all you want, but, you know, it's obviously a proven, scalable system. People know how to run it in production. Uh, it's just a great platform to start with, and that's why most people, you know, including the Hadoop community, started with it. And, oh, and I didn't mention, these, uh, all these photos are from the North Cascades National Park in um, uh, Washington State, near Canada. But anyway, this is one of the creeks in that park or rivers, and you know the foundation is the JVM for us. And we've had all these great tools that just keep getting better and you know more expansive. Uh, you know, the languages like Scala. You know, just to throw a bone here for closure. Uh, Eclipse. You know, the, uh, IntelliJ. Uh, a whole bunch of libraries like Algebra to Inspire that are reusable tools, whether you're running on Hadoop and MapReduce or Spark or whatever. And we've got a, just a, an incredible load of systems that have been built, many of which were created here in Silicon Valley. Uh, and, all, well, not all of them, but a lot of these are written in Scala, as, as you may know. Obviously, Spark. Scalding was a predecessor, in a sense, uh, at Twitter that uh, was my, you know, when I was grousing about Hadoop in 2012, it was about the same time I discovered Scalding, and suddenly I, you know, I saw some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Summingbird is another Twitter thing. Uh, probably many of you are using Kafka, uh, Cassandra as a database, and on and on. I won't read this whole list. Um, but, you know, so Hadoop is kind of what people think of when they think of big data. And just, you know, very roughly speaking, this is what a Hadoop cluster looks like. I, I write a job in something like MapReduce or some abstraction layer on top or now in Spark, submit it to this, you know, resource manager that then splits it up into JVM tasks running across the cluster. So, you know, how do we do it? Volume, uh, you know, basically doing everything in parallel. It doesn't matter how sucky MapReduce is, as long as we're running a lot of them, we can uh, hopefully sort of make it up in volume, as I said. Uh, and that's sort of what the, the really the argument was. Um, and then there's this distributed file system that uh, handles things like durability and, uh, you know, scaling up and all that. We don't need to get into this. Most of you actually probably know this already. It's, it's not exactly new anymore. Um, but, the, you know, the core compute engine as opposed to storage was this MapReduce API uh, that was really MapReduce. The names come from these sort of functional concepts we're used to, although uh, we're all experts here, so actually this is flat MapReduce. Uh, it was never really one-to-one -one mapping. It was always like ingest something and spew stuff out the other end and then reduce what came out the other end. So it was really more like flat map reduce. But I guess that didn't look good on a slide or something. So we ended up with map reduce. 
But it had a lot of problems. It turned out it was really hard to implement uh, algorithms in this sort of narrow, narrowly focused idea of mapping and reducing, especially if you had to do something that couldn't be done in like that one step of map reducing, or maybe I had to sequence things together. And the Hadoop API was particularly awful. It was really like, um, almost like an assembly language. It was so terrible. So for example, I thought I would go through an example of MapReduce, and I want you to uh, you know, pay, pay attention carefully as I go through this. Uh, so first we set up some structure, then we create a map step, and then a reduce step. And well, anyway, there's just a whole lot of boilerplate here, and it, you know, I mean, this is, uh, what am I doing here? I think I'm doing uh, inverted index. I forgot what I said. But um, it's actually not a complex algorithm, but there's just a whole lot of bit twiddling and, you know, sacrificing chickens and, you know, all sorts of things that you have to do to make this ecosystem happy. Uh, and you end up doing a software engineering problem. It takes a couple of hours. You make mistakes. You debug them. Actually, testing these things is a, another royal pain in the ass. Uh, pardon my French. Um, so it just wasn't a good way to work, and, but it was a simple problem. And simple things ought to be easy, right? And hard things ought to be tractable. Um, so we needed a better way to do that. Another problem was that uh, sort of a sea change in big data was we need to actually get answers faster. So, you know, 15, 20 years ago when the Internet started, it was, uh, you know, people like the Googles and the Yahoos and those of the world, all they, you know, they, they were just, um, you know, living in the sea of data that, you know, forced them to invent new ways of handling the scale. The best they could do was just try to capture it somehow and then go back later and run jobs to analyze it. So sort of batch mode was how the, the world lived. But actually my favorite example of this is like inverted index or more generally like a search engine. You know, if you think about what you know, Google and uh, those guys do, they have these web crawlers that are constantly walking the interwebs, uh, you know, and they're finding all the new content and then they, they, they capture like say the URL and the content and then they would run this batch job every few hours or whatever that would tokenize those words or those, those texts into words or phrases and then build up an inverted index of you search for something, here's the list of documents that have, uh, that use that word or phrase. And, and also the count of them is important because you don't want it to find the documents that mention Hadoop in passing, you want to find the documents that are obsessing about Hadoop because that's probably the content you want. But so that worked okay, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but then, you know, these days, you hear about a breaking news story, you go to Google and start searching for information. You don't want to have to wait 24 hours for Google to update its index with, you know, the, whatever breaking information or misinformation is on the CNN site, right? Um, you want to uh, see it immediately. So you'd really like to, you know, shrink that time from data arriving to value being extracted from it, and so streaming is now uh, become very important, even for problems that don't necessarily require streaming, as opposed to problems that do, like avionics, where, you know, if I detect that some aileron's out of position slightly, I want to correct it right away before the airplane tumbles out of control or whatever. Actually, some of the latest, uh, you maybe know this, the latest fighters actually fly in an unstable configuration because it makes them more uh, responsive, but they, they, they have to have computers constantly adjusting if, if a human could not actually respond fast enough to keep them uh, stable. Okay, um, and uh, you know, I sort of alluded a minute ago to the fact that MapReduce is actually very inefficient uh, in terms of all the sort of micro details, but they made it up in volume by running a lot of parallel stuff, but even that eventually catches up to you. You know, people con are concerned about power, concerned about the size of data centers. Um, and so they want better performance. So all these things were sort of adding up to, uh, and we have Cloudera to thank for this actually, you know, in late uh, 2013, they said, you know what, MapReduce has had a great run, it's been about five years, but we've really got to embrace something new, sort of the next generation compute engine. And uh, Spark had started around 2009, ironically about the time that MapReduce, or Hadoop in general, went mainstream. Um, but it had been, you know, evolving first as a graduate research project at Berkeley by, you know, a guy named Matei Zaharia. But it had gotten better and better, more uh, you know, performant, more flexible, uh, more, more durable and resilient and all that stuff. And uh, so they, they embraced, they being Cloudera, embraced Spark as sort of the next generation compute engine. So let's see how it does on, on these requirements that we have to do better than uh, MapReduce. Well, it, developer productivity is obviously extremely important, and as well as happiness. I find that productivity and happiness tend to go hand in hand for me. 
you know, if I'm just sort of slogging through something, I'm not, not a happy camper and I start trolling on the interwebs. Um, anyway, so we've got these very concise functional APIs. Uh, there's been a little debate on Twitter lately if this is really a functional API. Uh, no, it's not perfect, but it is actually a lazy, uh, you know, sequencing of combinators kind of API. I'll show an example shortly that uh, evaluates lazily the, the actual pipeline. So you're basically defining data flows normally, except maybe in the SQL query-ish kind of uh, alternative. And then you're, you're uh, evaluating that pipeline at some point down the road. But the cool thing is for you know, the broader community of people doing everything from ETL to uh, joining data sets to data science on the other end of things, you can actually use really four, actually it's more like five APIs, which is, you know, our favorites, Scala in Java, uh, but also Python and R, which of course are very popular in the, uh, you know, data science world, and even just write straight SQL queries, which is, um, well, what, one of the things I love about this, this sort of the life history of SQL is how it sort of went through this phase of being like, oh, you know, that's like old technology. We're on to NoSQL, right? So we don't need that stuff anymore. But then here it comes roaring back because you just can't keep a good man down. I mean, it's just such a powerful tool that uh, we, we, it just keeps coming back and uh, continuing to be useful. But anyway, you can get to choose all, you know, all five of these options if you want for whatever problem or, or your you know, preferences you have. Um, I think all of us know, especially if you came from Java to Scala, it's, it's a revelation when you suddenly get this, you know, interpreted evaluation loop, the REPL, that you can just, you know, interactively play with things and experiment and learn uh, and even do real work that way. And you get this with uh, all but the Java APIs. I should have added SQL to this. I guess I did add SQL to this. Okay. Forgot. Um, but we also need a lot more flexibility. I mentioned that MapReduce is very restrictive. Uh, with a, you know, a rich suite of functional combinators, we can think about the problem that, you know, the most logical transformation step to step as we're going from A to B, and then, you know, it actually just implement what makes the most rational sense. And that's a very liberating capability rather than just have to do this context switch of, oh, I've got this idea of how to do this, now I have to figure out how to force fit it into MapReduce. And this uh, sort of layer of combinators and some of the other things that we'll get to about Spark also makes it relatively easy to add stuff on top of it like machine learning algorithms, uh, iterative algorithms like training machine learning, and also graph traversal kind of algorithms. So these things are just kind of natural extensions when you have both the performance and the flexibility uh, to work with them. Actually, one of the things I'll mention, I don't think I really put it in the slides, but it's something that I think is underappreciated about tools like Spark, is the fact that they scale down as well as up. That kind of goes back to this idea of I can run it in a REPL, either locally, it turns out I can also run it on a massive cluster in a REPL if I want to. But scaling down is really crucial for when I want to just experiment, or I don't really truly have a you know, big data problem, I have a small but crazy data problem. I don't want to necessarily have to spin up a thousand node cluster, you know, just to, uh, you know, add one plus one or whatever. So it scales down beautifully. Effectively under the hood, the reason it works fairly efficiently is it's building up a directed acyclic graph, you know, lazily of whatever pipeline you're defining. And it does things like combining, uh, you know, sequencing steps together into stages that, um, you know, don't necessarily require like a new JVM process to be started every, you know, I go from map to flat map to filter. I don't need three JVM processes. I can mash that together into one JVM process and you get efficiencies that way. Uh, you have capabilities for doing um, caching of intermediate data so you don't keep reevaluating the pipeline when you're going to, you know, start at a state, you know, get to a point and then from there, you know, go off in different branches. You can do that kind of stuff. Uh, yesterday, I had the uh, privilege of um, visiting the IBM Silicon Valley Lab, which is down still in farm country, if you've ever been that far south in 101. Uh, and I gave it, uh, Martin Odersky and I were there, and we, we talked about Scala and reactive streams and all this stuff. And I didn't realize that it, when I was up here yakking away about reactive streams and Spark, that two IBM fellows were sitting in the front, one of whom invented row-level locking in DB2, and the other guy had been doing essentially back pressure and streaming data for about 20 years. 
And I'm, you know, talking to these guys, you know, like, well, there's this thing called uh, back pressure, you know, and, uh, and then afterwards they come up and talk to me, and they, and they were going on, uh, t telling me about, oh, man, when you do, uh, you know, back pressure, you've got to be careful about this, you know, scenario, if you've got a bunch of consumers, you know, how do you figure out the logic of getting it back, and if you don't, you know, stream everything together into stages, then you're, you're going to get huge bottlenecks, and Anyway, it's just kind of amazing that we keep reinventing the, the wheels over and over again. These guys have been doing it for 20 years. But, okay, back to the topic. Um, the other thing that's really neat is there's this new data frame API that's built on a SQL uh, query planner uh, that they implemented called Catalyst that actually gives us the same performance whether you're writing in Scala, Python, Java, or R, or SQL, which is really the first time in the big data uh, sort of space that we've actually been at a point where you could r actually write and deploy Python code and have it run at the same speed as Java code. It used to be with like MapReduce, your data scientists would do their, their nice model in R or Python and then they'd throw it over some cube farm wall to the, you know, the Java hackers who would uh, hopefully get it right, converting it to Java to get the performance. Those days are pretty much gone now. And then, I think this is the last bit on this, is that it has, uh, it's interesting, Spark was actually implemented as a batch mode system, just like MapReduce, but because of its uh, relatively good performance, they, they came up with a clever hack to do streaming, which is basically a mini batch model. It's not designed for individual event processing or sub-second latency, like avionics or whatever, but if you're okay with capturing data in like one to, you know, one second to say few minute intervals, and then processing those as a mini batch, which is you know great for a lot of problems for which we use streaming, then it works really well. And it actually, it has a, another interesting benefit, especially for those of you doing the Lambda architecture, where you often have like a streaming pipeline and a batch pipeline. A classic problem with that architecture is that you end up writing the same logic twice in, in like your streaming API system, say Storm or whatever, and your batch system, say MapReduce. With Spark Streaming, you basically write the code once, and then you just repurpose it for batch or um, you know, many batch streaming. So it's, it's an interesting capability there. At the core of Spark is this notion of a resilient distributed data set. Uh, the way I think of it, it's like a sharded collection uh, or partition collection over your, your cluster. And uh, it's resilient in the sense that if one of the partitions is lost, because it's built up this directed acyclic graph, it can actually go back and, and, and reconstruct the lost partition. And then they layered on top of that this notion of a discretized stream. So if I'm capturing these many batches, then each of those will be an RDD, and I'll you know, have like a sequence of these RDDs over which I can do window functions if I want, like moving averages and things like that. Okay, well, this is, uh, this is a Scala conference, so uh, this slide is maybe a little less relevant, but there are some data scientists like Vitaly Gordon who've embraced using Scala for um, uh, data science as opposed to Python, and obviously that's the, uh, how I want to do this too. Um, th this is a snippet of the inverted index actually implemented in Spark. I, for time's sake, I'm not going through the whole thing. But what I love about this code, and I think all of you have experienced this writing code with Scala Collections or Spark or Scalding, is that you have these combinators in red that you just sequence together and you, you know, pass in these functions to do the actual work. My favorite line is the one next to the word powerful, where basically I take a tuple with a nested tuple and move the parentheses, you know, in like, you know, 20 characters to, to restructure the, the data for the next stage in the pipeline. It's my absolute favorite line in this whole program because it's something that would, you know, if I did this in Java, I'd have to have like, you know, a factory tuple, master factory something. <laughs> but, but here I just move parentheses and I'm done, right? But we can also support our larger ecosystem besides this kind of core, you know, uh, functional API. We can write things like SQL in, in Spark and, and have it run at, at the scale we need. And, and they give us basically three ways, ways to do this, and I'll briefly talk about the first and the last. We can integrate with a, sort of the traditional standard uh, SQL tool for Hadoop, which is Hive, invented at Facebook, and it's one of the things that became one of the most important tools in Hadoop for raising the abstraction level above MapReduce. Spark has its own SQL dialect that's slowly getting to be, uh, you know, like a superset of Hive SQL. And then there's also this data frame API that I mentioned. I'll show you an example of that. 
But if I just want to write SQL queries, this is all it takes. You know, I basically do an import statement and, and create a, a Spark context and wrap that in a Hive context. Those are like the sort of the entry points to the system. And then I can just write SQL queries uh, like I would before. Now the show method is so, sort of like basically just dumps the first 20 uh, values in, in the resulting expression. Uh, that basically you get a data set back and it gives you the first 20 or so. Now those of you that uh, you know, like strong typing, which most of us hopefully do, will say, well this, looks, this doesn't look so great. This is stringly typed programming, right? I thought that was a bad thing. And it is a bad thing. I wouldn't do this in production, but I would do this in the REPL all the time because there's nothing like writing a group by statement or a join statement in SQL. It's, it's always faster to do it that way than to write it in a, an API because SQL is so concise. And if, you, that's, if SQL is the only language you know, then you've got a tool here that you can actually use. All right, so I guess I said this already. We're going to just write SQL queries. Now, if you prefer Python, it turns out for this example, all you have to do is make a few changes, just uh, replace the import statement with the equivalent in Python and delete the val keywords, and it basically is the same code. Yeah, the Python API is dramatically similar to the Scala API in general. There's more to it if you did the general API, but uh, it's really easy to go back and forth. But if you only want to write SQL, there's actually a REPL version that just takes you into a SQL prompt for Hive, basically, and you just write SQL queries as if you were in any uh, interactive REPL for a, data, uh, a database that you've ever used. So those same queries, you could just write like this. Now, uh, so stringly typed programming, that's bad, right? And it turns out you can do all of this with a, a more type safe API called the Data Frame API that's inspired by similar APIs in uh, Python and R, uh, for those of you that have ever played with those. So, and this is basically what it lo would look like. I find it easier to use the SQL personally because I know it. I don't quite really know this API well yet, but nonetheless, I would use this in production jobs because I can at least you know, do type checking. But basically the same sort of thing, we set it up with a SQL context, load some data in, a Parquet is a really popular column-oriented format in Hadoop now. Uh, the example, I'm pretending I'm loading word count data, which would be like, you know, I tokenized a bunch of documents and counted the words in them. Uh, so the, the data schema will be like, you know, a word and then it's count, so a two-column schema. And then I can reference stuff like, your know, dollar count, this is a, basically an interpolated string that they provide, I meaning it's the Spark API, and it lets me reference the count field in this data set. And I can order by that if I want to. I can show the first 20 characters, uh, 20 rows. I can cache the data because I'm going to use it subsequently for other queries and so forth. I can do things like filter for all of the words that are greater than 20 characters in length. You know, it writes the sort of stuff that you would typically write with SQL, but in a type safe way. And then I can save the results back to my file system if I want, in Parquet format, let's say. So that's more of how you would use this, uh, uh, you know, in a, like a production job, I think. The last API I'll talk about, and there's several add-ons on top of Spark, but one of the more fun ones is the machine learning uh, library called MLlib. And we'll talk, I'll, I'll actually walk you through an example of streaming k-means. So what this means is I'm going to, this will be a streaming context where I have data coming in. K-means is one of the simplest algorithms in so-called unsupervised learning where I don't know much about the data, but I think it clusters in some way. You know, if it's like um, uh, actual geographic data, uh, like actually a favorite example I played with recently is there's, uh, you know, a bike sharing service in Chicago called Divi now. And you can download their data sets and you can do clustering on that to see where most of the trips happened. You know, they happen to be, you know, clustered around like the loop area of Chicago or uh, up in the, you know, the, the restaurant areas and that sort of thing. But you could do this in streaming so as, as events are happening. So you're actually updating your, your model of the world in real time, so to speak. Or you can do it statically if you want, but th this one, I think, nicely combines a bunch of these pieces running on the core, the machine learning part, the streaming part, all you know, running on, on a core of uh, you know, some good ideas, resilient distributed data sets and so forth. So you know, it starts in the usual way with a bunch of import statements that I wanted to show for completeness. And you know, everything I've shown you basically are scripts, they're Scala scripts. I could have done this on the REPL if I wanted or just uh, sourced a script. Uh, this time, well, what happened to my thing here? Whoa, I did something wrong here. Let's try that again. I think I hit the wrong key. 
There we go. Uh, this time I'm going to wrap my Spark context with a streaming context, so that gives me the ability to say I want to capture, in this case, every 10 seconds of data as it's, as it's streaming in, I want to capture it. I'm going to capture actually two streams of data, one of which will be um, the data that I'm going to use for training, and I'm going to uh, parse these into so-called vectors. These, are, these aren't the, the usual Scala vectors. These are sort of, a, sort of a machine learning notion of a vector, which is basically like a list of features. It could be like latitude, longitude. It might be housing price, number of rooms, uh, location, you know, that kind of stuff. And then also test data, which is already labeled to be in a certain cluster. And so that's what a labeled point is. It adds a, a basically a label to a vector. And then I can train a, a k-means cluster. It's, real, it's really easy to do that. All I have to do is create an instance of this object and, and give it some properties, like how many clusters do I think there are? Um, let's say there's five, and that might be what k clusters is. Decay factor is how much do I want to use the data that I saw previously, or do I want to start clean with each iteration? And then uh, you can also say how to initialize. Well, basically what k-means does is you guess five locations and then you find, uh, like for all those five locations, you know, which points are closest to each of those centroids. And then you move the centroids to uh, be the, the true center of those new clusters, recalculate which clusters are assigned to which centroids, and iterate that way. And it turns out very quickly you iterate to a static point where you've got things clustered to its nearest centroid. And that's all this is going to do, but it's going to do it every t 10 seconds as I run. So I'm building up a pipeline here. I need a function that will take a labeled point and tear apart the label and features into a tuple because I'm going to pass that to these guys. So one of those data sets that's going to be streaming in, I'm going to train on it every 10 seconds. The other data set I'm going to use to predict what cluster this data belongs to based on the training data. I've got my data flow all set up. I'm going to start it and just let it run forever and wait for it to finish, which you know, usually means control C unless I give it a timeout. Well, anyway, whether you understand k-means or streaming isn't really the key thing. What I really want to get across is just the concision that's available and the ability to, uh, when you have a good foundation, you can build on top of it a bunch of different tools like streaming, like uh, machine learning, and then run them at large scale. So that's it. Thank you. Where'd Alexi go? Alexi. <laughs>